And uh, just a couple of closing thoughts on the, on what we were talking about. Tonight, if we can get to it, I want to cover three words tonight. We're still on that whole thing of the family and children and all that. And, you know, bear in mind that there's some, you know, there's some spiritual truth here that it's not just, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, you know, I'm not at that stage. I don't need this. And I'm, you know, my kids aren't at this stage or I don't have any kids or, you know, there's there's some truths that we're still uh, going to be very um very applicable. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, the Lord can, he'll give you a light on something almost unrelated to what's being talked about sometimes too. Um, Proverbs 23. And I want you to see a couple of words. Proverbs 23, 19. Your Proverbs 23, verse 19. It says, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Now watch. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. Notice he didn't say, don't be a wine-bibber, although, you know, that's, he doesn't want us to do that either. But that's not what he said. He said, be not among them. Look at Proverbs 24, Proverbs 24, verse 1. Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. Um, you know, uh, we, we closed out last week and we were um, talking about that thought of um, uh, your companions. And, um, you know, a lot of people think this. A lot of people think that um, uh, a church youth group is, um, you know, a safe place. Uh, and I want to say this, of course, you know, you want it to be. And, um, and, and I, I really, I really think I say this sincerely. I think God has blessed our church. I feel like uh, I, I don't feel like we have any toxic young people in the bunch at the moment. Uh, and of course that can change in a heartbeat. Uh, but I don't, I don't see any of that, and I'm thankful for that. But I grew up in churches where that sort of stuff was really promoted. Uh, I grew up in some larger churches through the years. We started going to church when I was six years old. And, um, man, a lot of the churches we went to, they all had youth groups. And uh, we would we would disappear and go to our youth group, you know, like it'd be Sunday night. They'd have the youth group program um, and all that stuff. They had youth activities. And you know what a lot of parents thought? A lot of parents thought, um, oh, this is great, you know, you know, and you know me, I'm always calling them Johnny and Susie. So that's just the names I picked. Um, you know, everybody always thought, you know, oh, they're there with all the, the, the young people, the church young people. So, oh, that, that's a good thing. Uh, that's very questionable. I um, mean, it's your job as a parent to be it's your job as a parent to be very aware of what is going on. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, then there's there's parties. Now, I know the world has their parties, but I'm talking about even, um, even um, you know, again, Christians getting together at somebody's house. Um, well, I'm talking about a bunch of young people. You get a bunch of young people together. Um, if there is not godly supervision, and godly is the great big key word, if there's not godly supervision, um, man, just, you know, there's just no telling all the, the carnal, fleshy, dark, loose, suggestive things that will be said and done. And a lot of those are just passing things. But here you are, you know, you've got your kid that you've worked hard at, you know, trying to keep them clean and trying to keep that filth out of their head. And all of a sudden... They get a good dose of it at a at somebody's house from the church. You know, I, I was at somebody's. Uh, I was with somebody's. Oh, it's a few months ago, and and their kid came up and said something. I mean, we're talking about a four or five year old kid, and it was nasty. And and we're all looking at each 
each other like, where did she pick up that? She picked up from somebody. And it was from somebody at church. Then there's uh, Bible college. You know, Bible college is often considered a place of real safety, but this is a naive and often fatal assumption. You know what the youth at Bible colleges are? They are the products of the homes they came out of. For a lot of young people, and, and so, you know, hear me out, hear me out. I'm going to try to qualify some of my statements along the way. But for a lot of young people that wind up at a Christian college, even at a good Christian college, um, you know what Bible college is for a lot of young people? It is their escape from what little restraint their home exerted. And so, you know, now they're free. If they were worldly at home, they continue to be. If they were fleshly when they were back home, they continue to be. If they were liars and sneaks, if they listened to rock music, if they fed on pornography at home, if they watched vile DVDs, they still do that at Bible college too. I knew a young guy that was at a, a, a good Bible school. Man, some of the Bible schools, like there's all sorts of degrees of them. And, but we'll talk, we're talking about independent Baptists, okay? Meaning the one that you would send your kids to, okay, in our church. You know, you, you right away think, oh, they believe the Bible. They're conservative. Um, they're, they're, they're going the, the same direction I, we are. Well, for some of them, that's absolutely not true. For some of them, that's moderately true. For some of them, they're really trying to, to, to hold the same values you and I hold. So this young person that I was dealing with went to one of the very conservative ones that really, I mean, they would they would like our kind of preaching. We'd like their kind of preaching. Uh, the, the guys that were running it, the ladies that were running it, they were good people, and they were really trying to do a good job. But you know what the problem was? The problem was the young people that were coming there. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the kid that was there, he told me, he said, uh, he said, man, he said, um, he said they were, he said that the people in charge were so naive. He said, even the, um, you know, they have the dean of men, you know, that or the dean of women, you know, they're sort of in charge. And then you have dorm supervisors and you have this chain of command that is supposed to help keep things in check. And you know what? They do the best they can. But the problem is this generation is two or three steps ahead of the older folks. And, and this, this kid told me, he said, you would not believe. He said, uh, you know, somebody would sound the alarm or they would, um, they would find a, uh, they would find a DVD somewhere, uh, a movie. And um, they weren't supposed to have movies in the dormitory of, of any kind. Uh, and you know, the thought behind that is they're going to keep the bad ones out supposedly, but, but, and he said, and you know, the ones they snuck in, they were, they were the R rated ones, you know, and, and PG-14 and, you know, all the ones that are really out there on the edge and some into the cesspawn. And he said, you know, all of a sudden, you know, somebody would sound the alarm and the dorm supervisor would come in and he starts searching and he couldn't find anything. Well, this, this particular young person got in trouble and, um, and he's talking to the dean of men and him and the dean of men get it all sorted out. And the dean of men looks at him and he says, and the dean of men was an ex-military guy, sharp guy. Good guy, loved the Lord, but he was in, he was probably 55 or 60. And he said, tell me so-and-so. He said, are they hiding movies? And he said, everywhere. And the, the dean of men's eyes got that big. And he said, how, where? He said, they're in the ceiling tiles. They're in the ceiling tiles. He said they're 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 taped up under the washroom lavatories. He said everywhere where you're not going to think to look. He said they're everywhere. And he said, and on top of that, he says you guys sound the alarm about the computers, you know, and guys come in and 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 they're gonna they're gonna check everybody's computers randomly. He said, but what you and the young person is telling the dean this, and he says, and what you don't understand is, he said they've got stuff hidden on their external hard drives. He said, they know how to hide things so deep in your computer that you can't find them and none of the guys you bring in to search can find them. And he said, and when you're not around, it's all back out. 
You say, where is that? U of A? Oh, no, that was at a conservative Bible college. And was it was it the school's fault? It was not. You see, that school wasn't just the staff. The school was the students. And who were the students? The reflection of the homes that they came out of. And so you send Johnny there, you send Susie there, and um, and maybe Johnny and Susie is, um, you know, maybe 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 they really love the Lord and they'll pick the right companions. But you know what so often happens is, uh, man, they get sucked right in. Here's what some people think. You know, they they have a they have a carnal teenager and they think, oh, I'll send them to Bible school and that'll help them. You know, that is very wrong thinking. A change of location never fixes anybody's issues. You know, the world has tried for many, many, many years that thought of, oh, We'll take, we'll take these poor, downtrodden, drug-using, you know, poverty-ridden people and we'll build them a brand new apartment and ship them to another town and suddenly they'll do better. And you know what they do? In three months, this place looks like the same trash hole that that place was and now it's full of drugs. You know why? Because of a change of location didn't fix the problem. The problem wasn't the location. I'll send Johnny to Bible school. That's not going to fix it. The problem is the heart. And God must fix the heart. Now, don't misunderstand me. You know, um, there's some good people at Bible schools. And, um, and it may be the will of God. It may be the will of God for a young person to go there. Um. <coughs> But I, here's what we're saying. If a young person has already been choosing wrong companions, he will choose them at Bible school also. You know, it's not, people think it's a safe haven. It, it is in some sense of the word, but it's not, if, if you send a young person there that's already leaning the wrong direction, they're just going to, they're just going to drift in the same hole that they were coming out of. All right, I want to give you three words tonight. I want to give you three words. I'm not sure we'll get to all three of them, but I want to give you the words communication and um, the word um, pressure and the word isolation. We're going to start with the word pressure, okay? Three words tonight that are going to be... Um, a real key thing with with um, your family and with your kids. Okay, and, and, and a lot of these things sort of overlap, okay? But um, I want to talk to you tonight about, first of all, about people pressuring you. People pressuring you. Okay? You know, sometimes what we're watching out for as parents is we're watching out for something that's very, very big and bad and terrible and and awful and so you know what it's like sometimes for some parents I, it's it's like they know they know that um the burglar is coming so you know what they do they've uh they're they're at the front they're camped at the front door man they got a shotgun there they got an ak-47 they got a couple hand grenades uh you know they're 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 ready they're at the front door and boy while they're watching the front door the enemy has come in through the back window and, and they don't even know he's there because they were so focused and their focus came out of a good heart. But they failed to realize there's more angles to this than just the obvious things. Um, Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and he says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles. He's sneaky. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. I mean, he knows what you're watching for. And so, you know what he's going to do? He's going to try to nail you where you're not watching. Watch out for your child or your teen um, pressuring you. Um, 
pressure pushing you to do something, trying to guilt you into doing something, um, trying to manipulate you into allowing something. I've watched you. Oh my! I've watched little kids manipulate their parents. It's just the wildest thing to watch. And you're standing there watching this and you think, where is mommy and daddy's brain at? As this little kid, oh, my soul. And they're manipulating their parents. Uh, look, 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 look. God put you in charge. You don't have to apologize for that. You don't have to feel bad about that. You're in charge. They're not. And watch out for that thing. They'll they'll pull on your strings emotionally. They'll 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 start. You know, there, there's all sorts of angles. It's it's amazing how how the sons of Adam can be so devious at such a young age. Your kids get a little older, you know, and this is usually when they're in the, their teenage years, their later teenagers years, and they may even throw a past bad decision in your face or a past error in your judgment. They may say, well, you know, the last time you said no about this, you were just panicking. It was right over the top. You know, you were afraid of this or that. and It turned out to be nothing. Yeah. And the answer to that is everybody's wrong once in a while. It's better to be safe than sorry. When you are being pushed when you are being pushed into doing something, and especially in the context of your children or teens, and that it may be coming from another adult on the outside, saying, come on, you know, you, you know you've got this bad feeling about something that they're, they're being asked to do or they're being invited to. And, and, oh, please remember, you don't have to have a chapter and verse for everything. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes too. But, you know, oh, well, you know, well, why can't Johnny do this? And, and you know what? You don't have a good reason even. But you just feel like something's wrong with this. You better pay attention to that feeling. You better pay attention. And, and, and in the background, this thing you're feeling, that's satanic. Hey, listen, it, help, it happens to everybody. Every once in a while, even as pastor, even as pastor, somebody will come up to me. And they'll make a suggestion. I am open to suggestions. I don't have any problem with suggestions. But every once in a while, somebody comes up to me and they say it. And most people are careful how they word it. But I just feel a, oh, behind the statement, you know. And they're, they're, they don't quite come out and say it like this. But it's like, well, pastor, you know, you know, isn't it about time we did this? And, you know, if you were, if you were a little more on the ball and, and really we need to do this. So we, and, and I'm going, hello? It's like all of a sudden I'm feeling this push. And I'm like, okay, that means the answer is no. That's what that means. That's what that means. Because God's not going to push me. You know, God will lead me. You know, I'm open to suggest. Many of you have made suggestions uh, and, and ask, you know, and I'm, not, I'm open to any question. Pastor, I think we should do this. What do you think? Oh, you're not for it, Pastor. Well, why do you think that? I'm, oh, man. But when I feel somebody doing this, it's like, no, God's not within a thousand miles of that. Not even remotely. When you are being pushed, and you need to remember this, I don't care how old you are, children or no children, when you are being pushed, it should be a huge red flag. There is a key statement. I got it from a, from a missionary of long ago. Her name is Isabel Kuhn. Many of you are familiar with Isabel Kuhn and, and her work and her writings. Um, and I think she got it from somebody else. We've often quoted it. The statement is this. The Lord leads men. The devil drives them. He leadeth me beside still waters. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and, and they, they follow me and and I lead them in and out. And it, um, but what does it say about the devil? It says the devil takes his people captive at his will. You know, there, there's, there's no, uh, he, he's, he's, he's the pusher. I knew a man of God that for many, many years traveled and preached on the home. And uh, he's, he's in his um, late 80s now. And he, he doesn't travel anymore. But I remember something he said. 
He said, generally speaking, your gut feeling will be almost infallible as a parent. You know, you, you know, something comes up and it involves Johnny or Susie and, um, and, you know, maybe you're fine with it, you know, and, but, but boy, there might be something that's just making you pause a little bit. He said, pay attention to that. And it, it may not mean that your teen can't do that, but maybe something needs fixed. Maybe something needs adjusted. Maybe there's a piece of the puzzle you don't have. Um, he said, pay attention to your, your gut feeling. Every time I felt uncomfortable with the situation. Now, I'm not talking about on a whim or because I was in a bad mood. But every time I felt uncomfortable with the situation and I have said yes anyway, because I didn't want to say no and I didn't want to disappoint somebody and I didn't want to be a stick in the mud, you know, that invisible pressure. Every time that I went ahead and said yes, every time I've been sorry. Every time. Look at Colossians 3 with me. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 15. Colossians 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let that be the, the thing that's guiding you. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you're also called in one body. And be ye thankful. But, you know, we, we would all agree. We would all say, you know, yeah, amen, that's true. But, but all that said, that can be very subjective. So, you know, sort of what you have to realize is the context of that verse. So look at the context of that verse. Look, look at the beginning of the chapter. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Look at verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. That's talking about like um, lustful, immoral things that are way out on the edge and past the edge. And covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake cometh the wrath of uh, the for which the things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Look at verse eight. But now ye also put off all these: anger, wrath, malice. That's being spiteful, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Look at verse 16. Let the word of God... I'm sorry, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with melody, uh, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So wedged right there is verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So, you know, if all these other things, you know, where you're pursuing them, you're trying to you're trying to live in the light of those things, then then you can trust that that thing of you know some people say, you know, well I just I just had peace about doing this or that or the other, and yet and yet they're violating half that passage. You know what? They didn't have any peace at all. What they had was they just, oh yeah, I think it'll be okay. And, uh, and, you know, they didn't want to bother, and they just, they just, the peace of God is something that's wedged into that context. Peace of 
people pressuring you. The peace of God. A number of years ago, um, I knew a, a family that traveled and that sang together. And um, and they were a real blessing. And um, their their oldest son was, uh, you know, they, they traveled and they met people. And, and he got engaged to this girl. Um, they were, they were seeing each other and, and, you know, and all that. And, and so what happened was, uh, he, they were engaged and he, he had her come and spend a couple weeks with them. You know, I think it was like around Christmas time. Um, this girl was a Christian girl, you know, she attended one of the churches that they went to. And, and so she was around the house for a few weeks and the, um, the dad and mom of the son, as they were around her and interacted with her, they just sensed something wasn't right. But they didn't have anything hard, hard and fast. You know, she hadn't cussed. She hadn't smarted off. You know, she wasn't being lazy in the kitchen. You know, there, there, was, there was nothing you could put your finger on. But as that two or three week period played out, they just felt really uncomfortable. And they warned their son. They said, son, um, you know, wow, we, we don't even know why, but we don't feel good about this. Can you just can you just stall this for a while? But he was bent on marrying her because he loved her. And you know what? They didn't have a good reason to really try to block the marriage. So they they let them get married. And here's what happened on their honeymoon night. Truth is stranger than fiction. On their first night, I mean, they just had the wedding, just had the big shindig, just got all the gifts. They arrive at their honeymoon spot. And all of a sudden she looks at him and she says, she says, now I just need you to know something. She said, I don't love you. And I never did. She said, but me and, a few, me and a few of the girls, we had a bet on. And I bet them that I could get you to marry me. And I won the bet. You know what he did for the next year? He cooked the food. He washed the dishes. He did the laundry. And he tried to make her fall in love with him, all to no avail. And a year later, she walked. And I mean, the rest of history, she's, you know, they were divorced and, and life moved on. You know what the parents had? They had no peace. And that was a warning from the Holy Ghost of things to come. He couldn't see it. Um, young people, uh, if you have parents that love the Lord, it would really be wise to listen to them. And especially in these kind of things. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. Be, be, be very careful about people pressuring you. So I want to go to the second word tonight. And I want to, the second word is communication. Communication. You need to have real open, and, and I stress the word open communication with your children. And this is critical all across the board. You would be amazed at the parents that do not talk with their children. Now, when I say that, here's what I mean. You know, I, I, I didn't say, when I say talk to your children, I, I'm not talking about fussing at them or commanding them, but do you do you talk to them? Do you sit down? Do you ever talk about anything? Do you, do you have, do you discuss the important things? Um, a lady related to me how her mom never told her about those things that happen to women, you know, when they get about 12 or 13 and those, those, you know, cycles that come around and, um, she said her mom never told her anything. And so, and I'm trying to be real discreet, obviously. 
But you, you need to hear this, ladies. You need to hear this. She said when her first one came around, she didn't know what was going on. And uh, her mom came to the bathroom door and threw something at her and uh, walked away. No explanation, no instruction, then or later. And this was a Christian home. A lady in the church we used to pastor told us, she's a good lady. She's, she's a good lady. It came up in conversation with my wife. Now, everybody listen, look up here. That she had never explained the birds and the bees to her daughters. She had a few teenage daughters. And I mean, we're not talking 13. They were, they were considerably older. And one of the daughters, who was the youngest at that time, who was 15 or 16, had asked her mom some questions on more than one occasion. But the mom always put her off. Ladies, think about that. What a perfect opportunity when they're coming to you. But the mom felt awkward. She knew that she should talk to her daughter. She acknowledged that. But she would not break out of her comfort zone to help her daughter. So her daughter could hear the clean instruction instead of the raw and the filthy instruction. And because she would not talk to her daughter, her daughter figured it out later through movies and dirty DVDs and corrupt relatives. They filled the gap that her mother refused to fill. She would not talk with her daughter. I'm, I'm telling, I'm asking this morning, this evening, and I want you to think, and you, you people that are young people, you know, there comes a day and, and, and look, 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 it doesn't start when they're 16 and you go, Oh, you know, I think we should start talking now. No, 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 no. I'm, I mean, I hope to God, maybe it works if that's where it comes to. But you know, if you start right here when they're little and you're talking and you have heart to heart, and man, you're sharing and they can share with you. And, 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 and if you just keep that thing going, it's just, it's just natural. It's just natural. She would not talk with her daughter. She, she, now listen, she had no problem fussing at her daughter. Not a drop. She had no trouble correcting her daughter. She had no trouble homeschooling her daughter. But there was very little heart communication. One of the keys to you and your children and you maintaining an influence for God in their life. You know, the day will come, parents, when, you know, when they're this high, praise God, man. You can, uh, you can give them some shock treatments and you can help get the devil out of them. But there comes a day when they're this tall, and I really know what that's about. They're this tall, and you're this tall, and you know what? You can't bend them over your knee anymore. And I, I read a guy, a guy was talking about all this, and he said, he said, there comes a day when all that you've got left is influence. And he said, you better hope to God that you've maintained that. How do you maintain that? Well, first of all, by not being hypocrite, by being the real deal. And secondly, by open communication. Open communication. You should be able to talk freely with them about anything, and they should be able to talk freely with you about anything. And I, I mean in a clean and discreet way. But this should be cultivated. Um, it requires a little bit of time, and it must be done on purpose. Um like here, here's your, 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 your kids, you know, they're, they're this high and then they're this high. And, 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 um, you know, you notice, you know, um, Johnny's, you know, Johnny's hanging around with, with Bill and Henry and, and all that stuff. And, and, uh, you know, it'd be good some night just to sit down and say, Johnny, tell me about Bill. Is he good? Does he talk about questionable things, Johnny? So, uh, Johnny, uh, no, listen, parents. So, Johnny, you want to go to Fred's house, do you? Okay. Um, Johnny, who else is going to be there? You know, you might change your mind about letting them go to Fred's house if you knew who else was going to be there. But a lot of parents, they don't think to ask. Ask. Now, there's a word here. 
And the word is exactly. Ask exactly what they're going to do at Fred's house. What are you going to do at Fred's house? Do not accept a surface answer. Oh, oh, I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Oh, we're just going to play and have fun. Okay. So, so what does that mean? You have no idea what they're going to see or be exposed to on somebody else's computer monitor or video games, even at a church kid's house. Pay attention to the character of the other friends of these other kids and the character of the kids. You know, like right now, I'm saying this, and and, and our church, I really believe, we, we've got a whack of good kiddos here. I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to sound alarm buzzers. I'm saying this because somewhere, somehow, one day, maybe the Holy Ghost is going to remind you this because you're going to need, you know, you're going to be somewhere and 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 the Lord's going to remind you, um, maybe you ought to ask about this. Birds of a feather flock together. I have a pastor friend. He was telling me he, he's got a church of um, um, between two and three hundred people. And he said, you know, when a new teenager comes to church, he said, it doesn't take me long. And he said, I know who they are and what they are. He said, I don't even have to talk to him. He said, I just watch after a few weeks who they connect with. Now, in his church, they have a big, you know, 300 people. They got a bunch of young people. And they've got some young people that really love the Lord. And they got some that really don't. And he said, invariably, he said, they will find their own kind. And that's who they'll that's who they'll hook up with. An old saying in the world, show me who your friends are, and I'll show you who you are. Where it gets sticky when your kids are small is occasionally somebody will notice that you don't let your child or your teen be around their child or their teen. And again, that's not a problem here. But it gets comical because some of these people will have the gall to confront you. And they'll say, uh, what's wrong with my kid? You won't let Johnny come to my house. You, and you ready? You, you think you're better than us, don't you? You know, if the devil can't get you to do wrong, he will try to make you feel guilty about doing right. And he will accuse you through someone else of being harsh and over strict and a Pharisee and self-righteous and how you're turning people off. You know, the devil, he's, he, he knows how to talk like Baptist talk. And so he'll, he'll just load you down with it. So you think you're better than us. You can almost hear the, the serpents hiss. A guy I know told of a, a friend who had a run-in with a neighbor over this very thing. And here's what he said after the run-in. He said, I will let the whole neighborhood go to hell before I lose my son or my daughter. To which we say, amen. I had a friend of mine and he was a crazy guy in his own right, but he loved the Lord. And um, they lived in a trailer park for a while. And in a trailer park, you know, I, I've lived in one and, you know, it's trailer and about 12 feet over. There's another trailer and about 12 feet over. There's another trailer. So it's nice and cozy. And um, and and you get a bunch of young families in there and you get all the kids and they're all playing together. And he said the problem was he said it was it was hot weather. And then and so we had our doors open. We had screen doors. And he said, uh, so I got to hear what went on in my neighbor's house. And he said it was terrible. Like he said, it was terrible. And he said, uh, uh, the, na the neighbor girl, you know, she was just, you know, I don't know. They were like four or five or six, something like that. And, and uh, boy, oh, boy, I remember my, my little neighbor. Uh, he, he was about four or five. Man, he could cuss with the best of them. Oh, he could, he could swear up and down. And uh, so my friend... They had their, their first daughter, and um, 
she was, you know, six or seven. And he, he didn't want his daughter hanging out with the, the neighbor girl. And the neighbor girl was all the time coming over, you know, knocking the door. Can, um, can Sharon come over and play? And, and he was always, you know, making up an excuse and, you know, and all this. So, so finally, after a while, you know, the neighbors pick up on stuff. They're not totally stupid. And the neighbor stormed over and confronted him and said, what's wrong with my daughter? And my friend, God gave him great wisdom. He said this. He said, oh, oh, actually, it was it was it was the, the mom. Imagine that it was the mom that came storming over. And she said, what's wrong with my daughter? And he said, oh, it's not your daughter, ma'am. It's my daughter. He said, my daughter is so wicked and rebellious. And he says, she has such a sinful nature that I figure I need to be watching over her all the time. And it's safer for your daughter that way. And he said, she just stood there. <laughs> the neighbor didn't know what to say. You know, the Bible says wisdom is justified over children. You're going to have to learn to run the risk of seeming overly strict. And all the other names they'll call you. With most Christians, the devil doesn't really need to do anything drastic to stop them. He just needs to call them a name or have their relatives call them a name. And they are terrified of being labeled. But, you know, we need to learn that being labeled or embarrassed, and the Bible has a word for that. It's called shame and reproach. Uh, we need to learn that that's, you know, that or being talked about or being excluded. It's a small, it's a small price to pay for the spiritual safety of our children. So that takes me to the last word. And the last word is isolation because some people will say, you know, and it's a good, it's a good question. Some people will say, aren't you isolating your children? And you know, the, the devil just has a way of making you feel stupid. And it, it just sounds so reasonable. Aren't you isolating them from reality, from the real world, from real people? How are they going to be able to handle real life? And so that brings up two words that um, you'll often hear. People say, you know, your, your child needs to be socialized. Um, you know, your child needs exposure or it's not, gonna, it's not going to be able to function in the real world. Now, I know there's a, there, there are extremes in, even in the right direction, and, and I'm not really going to deal with that tonight. Um, but... I heard a man say many years ago, he said, God will often isolate someone before greatly using them. And did you know, there's some real Bible examples of that. Look quickly with me at 1 Samuel 16. Now, when I say isolate, I'm not talking about, you know, stick them in a tent, you know, 40 miles from the grid. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about how people will accuse you. You know, oh, you're 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 isolating your children. Um, well, you know, that that all depends on what you mean. But there again, can we be brave enough just not to be afraid of the Oh, not to be afraid of the name calling. You know, I've learned and you guys know it, too, that when somebody has no real reason, you know, you're dealing with somebody Friday nights on the street. How often does it happen? You're talking to somebody and you're reasoning with them. And when they realize they're losing the argument, what do they do? They resort to name calling when they have no further viable information or evidence. Name calling is always that last resort. Um, you know, hey, listen, you know, can't we, you know, this, this doesn't apply in 2023. But when we were kids, we would say sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's not true in 2023. Now, everybody, now, everybody, you call them a name and they have a nervous breakdown. You got to give them some medicine to get them over. <clears throat> you know what God intended us to be? Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Be strong in the Lord. You know, what? if they call us a name, thank God they didn't throw any rocks at us. You know, they didn't stone us like Stephen. You know, they didn't drag us out of our house like Saul. 
They just called us a name. We should say, praise the Lord. That's all we ought to say. But it's so often people go in the house and they cry. <laughs> How are they going to be able to handle real life? Quickly, 1 Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. Verse Samuel 16, verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he, that Samuel, looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointing is before him. Now what Samuel's doing is he's reviewing all the sons of Jesse. He's looking for a king. God said, I've got a king among the sons of Jesse. So now he's looking at all the sons of Jesse. Verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. By the way, he was very well socialized. You need to remember that. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, the Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all thy children? He's like, wait a minute. The Lord told me one of these kids was the one. He's going, what's going on here? Verse 11, there remaineth yet the youngest. And where is he? He's isolated. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. I've got several verses in front of me. We can look at chapter 17. Um, look at verse 19 um, of this same chapter. Chapter 16, verse 19. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Several places. It always refers to David. Where's David? David's with the sheep. Where's David's brothers? Oh, they're on, they're on the front line of the combat. Oh, they're very well socialized. They're hanging out. The, and, and, you know, maybe it wasn't their choice. Uh, so don't miss the point of what I'm saying. But but where is David? I don't think your kids should be uh, socially awkward. You know, we always crack jokes about, you know, homeschoolers that, that can't look at you and, and they sort of act, you know, like they haven't been out of a cave in 12 years. And, you know, you know, um, look, 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 our kids in this room, we got a bunch of homeschooled kids. They can interact. You know, parents, again, that's your job to teach them to be normal. You know, I, when I was a little kid, when I was six years old, my dad, people would come up and shake hands, you know, and I was new to all this because dad just started going to church. People come up and shake her hand and, you know, I'd sort of act all bashful. They talked to me and I'd look at the floor and my dad in his ever so gentle way said, son, he waited till they were gone. Son. I said, yes, sir. Because you had to say yes, sir. He said, son, <laughs> he said, when someone shakes your hand, he said, you look them in their eyes and you say, good to see you today, sir. And he said, and, and, and he's sitting right there and here comes the next one. And I learned the hard way. You didn't play around with those orders. And it you know what? You know what? It took me about, took me three or four times and man, I got the hang of it. Felt pretty good. I could look him in the eyeball. Made me feel like a big dude. Yeah. Good to have you. Thank you, sir. And, you know, that's your job to teach them not to be a social reject. And it's easy. It's not hard. Several references, and even in the Psalms, it's that God says, when I found, he said, God says in the Psalms, he said, you know where I found the leader of my people? I found him on a hillside. All alone. With the sheep. You know what a blessed place that was? David learned his sling. David was strong as a bull from messing with those sheep. David was not a stranger to hard work, but David learned from being alone that he could make it alone. He could stand alone because he had been alone. And his head wasn't full of garbage from all the other young people in Bethlehem because he wasn't around them. He was in an isolated place. Let me give you another example. Look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1.
You know who the Lord said was the greatest man born of women? Somebody tell me. John the Baptist. Look at Luke 1, verse 80. This is talking about John the Baptist. Luke 1, verse 80. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the shopping malls till the day of his showing unto Israel. That's not where he was, was it? Man, you talk about isolation. You say... Well, you know, those kids, they've got to learn how to function. Uh, do you realize all of a sudden he's 30 years old and he steps out on the scene? And the next thing you know, he's in the palace of a king going eyeball to eyeball with King Herod. I'd say that's pretty good. That's pretty good. He did just fine. And God used him greatly. People say, are you protecting them? Aren't you protecting them from reality? How are they going to be handle real life? And by the way, now, okay, now this is for everybody. That is one of the excuses for so little control or concern over the movies people watch, the DVDs, the magazines, the Internet activities, you know, and they're watching all this questionable stuff, this filthy stuff. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. OK, well, you use a word like that. People say, well, that's not me. Oh, yeah. You wouldn't watch it if Jesus was sitting there. And you know what? He is there. Well, you know. You know, Pastor, well, you know, you know, they, they cuss in real life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so I'll find the worst cussers I can find, and I'll bring them up to your door, and I'll say, well, well, hi, Brent. I got five of my buddies with you. You don't mind. You're just going to cuss a while. Come on, guys, have at it. You know what you do? You would throw them out on your ear. So why is it okay? Why is it okay on your on your computer? Why is that okay? It's not okay. Oh, well, that's real life. Okay, so so let's follow that argument to its logical conclusion. Are you ready? We're about done. You ready? Why not take your son to a stripper club? After all, nudity is a real problem in our society, right? I, I just can't help but throw this in right here. Uh, I was listening to a message the other day, and this guy said he had a, a guy that just got saved in his church. Well, he, he, he had been saved for just a little while. And he said that when he first got saved, he was going to one of those contemporary churches, you know, like downtown with the with the lights and the black ceiling and the, the smoke and all that. And this guy had gotten saved. And he said, you know, he said, when I when I got saved, he said, I didn't know any better. And he said, I was going to one of the churches. And he said, I couldn't help but think, man, this looks like the strip club I was in. Nobody would accuse us of that. Why not take your son to a strip club? I mean, nudity is a real problem, right? So that's reality, right? You, you don't want to shield your kid, do you? You say, Pastor, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it is ridiculous. And so is that argument. Well, drugs are a problem, aren't they? Oh, my soul, like never before, and especially in Edmonton. So uh, why don't you bring some narcotics home and let him sample them? Because they're a real problem, right? You know, you don't want to shelter him, right? That is so stupid. You say, that's ridiculous. No, no, it's not ridiculous. When we were in Northern Ontario, we went to a church there, a good church. And there was a lady there that professed to be a Christian. And she attended on Sunday mornings. And you know what she did? Her son turned 18. You ready? She took him to one of the bars in town. And she got him drunk. So that he would come home. Puke his guts out, and he'd be all done with drinking. Let me tell you how that worked out. Did he get turned off from drinking? Oh, no. It just got him started. That's all that did. She thought, oh, I want to, I want him to see the real life. He can't, you know, it's real life. Oh, yeah. And so she just threw him in the sewers, what she did. I close with this. Brother Gip, when he was a, uh, we're praying for Brother Gip tonight, Brother Gip 70. Brother Gip was 
Brother Gip was 28, 29, 30. He was, uh, he was the youth director at the church where I went to Bible college. And I, I just, I came just a few years after, just literally the year after he moved on. So I never saw him there, but it was a big church. I mean, that church in that day ran 15, 1600 people. So I had big youth group. And, um, and so one day, one of the helpers, one of the adults, you know, you have all these adult helpers. One of the adults said, uh, I came up to Brother Gip and said, yeah, he said, I just, I just went and watched and he named the movie. It was a brand new movie. And it was um, uh, um, one of those, you know, rated R things. And it was blood and guts and Satanism and sex and all that stuff. And, um, and, and he told Brother Gip, he said, yeah, he said, I, I went and watched it. So I, I would know what was wrong with it. He called it research. And Brother Gip looked at him and said, well, I hope you never need to do any research on sodomy. Do you understand how foolish that is? And, you're, you, and we feel intimidated because our relatives say, well, you're shielding them from reality. Guilty. Yes, sir. Gladly, on purpose, by design. Yep, that's what we're doing. We got some people in here that grow gardens and you know, uh, you, you know what you do with, you know what you do with your precious tomato plants. You keep them together. What's that? You keep them together. <laughs> there you go. You take your precious tomato. You just, you bought it at the greenhouse and you bring it home. Uh, or, or, or maybe you plant them yourself and you've got them in those little cups and, and you know what you don't do. You know, uh, you don't plan until uh, what is it? May long weekend. And do you know why? Do you know why you do that? You keep them in the greenhouse. You say, well, well, that's not real life. I mean, frost is real life. I mean, the cold and the wind and the freezing ground. I mean, I want hardy tomatoes. I mean, let, let's just give them the real world. Go ahead, dummy. Do you know what you do? You keep them sheltered. Until the time is right. And when the time is right, they're ready for the outdoors. And with every child, that time will be different. Well, they're 18 now. <laughs> no, that's pretty faulty reasoning. You know what? Those three words are going to be critical. Pressure, communication, and isolation. Remember these three things, and hopefully it'll be a help to you. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth. I pray, Lord, that nothing I've said would be misunderstood. Lord, if I've raised a question, if, I, if I've created confusion, Lord, please help folks to know they can freely come. And Lord, I don't have all the answers, of course, Lord. But God, we'll try to be all the help we can be with your help. But God, I pray you'd help all these parents in here. Lord, these parents have done well. But Lord, the, uh, the pressure and the satanic stuff and the attacks, and Lord, that will never cease. And, Lord, it will never cease on these young people. And I pray, Lord, you'd help them, even the young people in this room. Lord, they will be pressured by friends. Lord, they'll be pressured by other adults. Lord, help them to realize, Lord, that they can safely, uh, gladly stand, Lord, for thee. And, uh, Lord, I just pray you'd bless. I pray somewhere out there in the future, Lord, that you'll bring something to mind. Lord, I pray you'd help these parents, Lord, that they would begin Lord, and it may be awkward at first. It, it may not be smooth. But Lord, help them to cultivate communication with their children. Help the children in this room, the young people, to realize what mom and dad are trying to do. Help them, Lord, just to rejoice in it and to cooperate. Lord, help us all. Lord, and protect us, Lord, from the wiles of the devil, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord.
Lord, I thank you for the families that are in this room. Lord, I don't believe there's a, a bad young person in the lot. I don't think there's a bad parent in the bunch. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what you've given us. But Lord, bless and preserve what we have. And God, may we, may we go on the aggressive for thee. May we raise up soldiers for thee. May we be soldiers for thee. God, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.